as he leaves, thank you, Commissioner Pallison. That was that was a great tour de force and 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 plenty of quotable things that, that I've written down in, in terms of uh, how to perceive the, 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 the power markets. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, and um, Adam Keach. Uh, I think we, we have the technology loaded for a presentation you're going to share with us, Adam. Uh, Adam is the Executive Director of Market Operations at PJM Interconnect. I think a lot of people in this room know, know Adam, but uh, uh, Adam's been at PGM for over 15 years in both market operations and system operations. Um, we, you are currently responsible for the efficient design operation of the electricity markets. Uh, I actually was thinking you're really currently uh, in charge of the spaceship Mir now, I think, is so the, all the various spinning market parts that, that come together. Um, Adam, uh, Adam also, I think, has, uh, uh, looking at LinkedIn, a very very attractive child on LinkedIn pages. I, I sort of enjoyed that. You, usually you get a LinkedIn profile and you see just some very, very professional headshot, but we got to, I think, meet what I suspect is your son uh, uh, when, when I looked at the page as well. So I enjoyed that little personal touch and, and, and as well. But Adam uh, is really, uh, you know, I very much appreciate you coming to, to give PJM sort of perspective on some of these issues and then having this We've already lined up the com a lot of the comments you'll be having, so I think you'll be able to sort of anticipate and maybe sort of and discuss some of what you've heard from your friends in the commissions already as you go through your presentation. So with that, um, let's invite Adam to the stage, and uh, uh, thank you for being here. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, if you did look at my LinkedIn page, that is my oldest son, Landon. Uh, that is an old picture. He is uh, he's maybe four in that picture. He's about seven now, so we're going through golf lessons and learning to play t-ball and stuff like that. So it's been, it's been a whole lot of fun. I should probably depersonalize that a little bit now that I know everybody's looking at it. So, uh, <laughs> but with that, so um, Commissioner Palson is always tough to follow. Uh, I'll probably keep it... Um, short and sweet in terms of some of the proposals that I'm going to talk about from PJM today. Um, just in case you are not as familiar with PJMs, I know some of you are, uh, PJM is the dark blue footprint you see there. Uh, there's some of the bio statistics on the right hand side. I won't take a ton of time to go through them, but it is a, it is a large footprint, uh, roughly 165,000 megawatts of load. Uh, covering the area you see there, New York down to North Carolina and as far west as, as uh, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, three main focuses we've got. I'm going to touch on uh, system operations and, and uh, system planning today a little bit. Um, the three topics that I want to talk through today are three fairly large initiatives that have gone on in PJM for probably the last uh, couple of years. Some of them newer than others. Uh, but the three that I want to hit on are uh, energy and reserve price formation, capacity repricing, and resilience. So I'm going to start with energy and reserve price formation. So PJM's role as the market operator, operator, we calculate the market clearing prices for energy over on over 12,000 points on the system every five minutes. And we also calculate reserve clearing prices for multiple areas within the footprint. And the concept there is we're trying to articulate what is the value of energy or reserves in this portion of the footprint. Uh, the way we do that today has largely been the same since these markets were stood up in the late 90s. Um, back in 2016, PJM started to look at energy and reserve price formation and try to look at these in terms of, well, how do we do this better? That sort of thought process and that research process that we are on now is largely driven by a FERC docket. So FERC has this broad price formation docket uh, that the docket number is 801414. It's called the price formation docket. And it hits on a number of different topics, but the one that really sort of spurred our thought process around this was one that was called the Fast Start NOPR, so NOPR being Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, uh, where FERC issued a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking that said, essentially, resources that can start quickly but are not dispatchable, meaning they, they can't change their output, they have to operate at a single operating point, those types of resources traditionally can't set the market clearing price. And they can't because when we go to determine the LMP, we're trying to figure out what the cost to serve the next megawatt of load is. 
And because those resources aren't dispatchable, they can never be dispatched to serve the next megawatt of load and therefore can never be marginal and never set the clearing price. And what FERC said in the Fast Start and OPER was, you guys have to change that. By not letting these resources set the clearing price, you are affecting rates. Uh, you have prices that may not reflect the true cost to serve load. And so essentially, they proposed a way to fix that. So that was back in, I believe it was December of 2016. Uh, and really from there, we started to look at the Fast Start and OPER as, okay, well, we understand what FERC wants, we agree with what FERC wants, but why would they limit it to Fast Start units only? We've got other resources that have inflexible ranges that are needed to maintain reliability, so if the issue is the units aren't flexible, and that's why they can't set price, well, there's other resources that are in that category too, and they may or may not be Fast Start, but they're needed to serve reliability either way. So why shouldn't they set price? And so we did a bunch of research. We looked with a lot of academics. We put out a couple work papers, one in June of 2017 uh, and one uh, in November, uh, which was much more voluminous. Uh, and we started a stakeholder process uh, just this past January to start talking about price formation issues. At the heart of the issue, um, well, let me, let me just segregate. There's two issues right now. So there's, a, there's the fast start issue, which is the FERC uh, proceeding. So FERC initiated this fast start issue that said fast start resources should be able to set price. Where we are with that right now is PJM has filed comments. Uh, anyone else interested in that docket has filed comments and that proceeding is in front of FERC right now. FERC has said that they intend to file on that by the end of this September uh, and we'll see where we end up there. But for right now that proceeding is in front of FERC. The broader price formation initiative that PJM has put out there, so this is going back to the November paper, that is in the stakeholder process right now. And we've done a little bit of shuffling of the priorities of the stakeholder process, and I'll touch on that towards the end of my uh, piece on price formation. But really, the broader price form formation initiative is sort of being put on the longer term uh, scope list. And in the shorter term, we're trying to address issues around reserve market pricing and shortage pricing. I'll talk about that in a couple slides here. Um, so the goal for the prices, just at a general level, these are the goals that we put out for prices. So the price formation initiative has been tied to a lot of different things. At its heart, we are trying to make the prices as good as possible. And by as good as possible, we mean they meet all of these criteria. They send clear incentives, they reflect what's going on in the system, they're transparent, and they're as simple as they can possibly be. Uh, we have a way that we do that today and it creates a set of prices that we get out today, and there's also a set of uplift. And uplift is the amount of money that gets paid to supply resources when they don't collect enough from the, from the market uh, to cover their operating costs. That uplift component is a very sore spot in the market, and it is the cause for a lot of concern and a lot of um, potentially bad incentives within the market. And so in order to get the prices better, from PJM's perspective, we want to minimize that uplift. It results in price signals that send uh, signals that, are, that capture more of the costs for resource to operate in the market. They minimize the bad incentives to try and collect uplift payments outside of the market, which has different incentives than participating in a competitive market. And so from our perspective, we want to minimize this uplift bucket. We think we know ways to do that better than we do it today. And in large part, that's where the price formation initiative comes from. So just at a high level, to give you an example, so on the left-hand side of the graphic uh, there, you'll see what do we include in the market clearing prices. And so today, when a generator submits an offer, they submit what we call a three-part bid. And those three parts are startup cost, no load cost, which is the cost to operate the unit at, uh, at any output level. It's sort of a base operating cost. And then the incremental energy cost, which is uh, a function that sort of articulates how the cost of the resource changes with output. And so today, when we calculate prices, we only include one of those costs in the clearing price, and that's the incremental energy cost. The startup and no-load costs aren't included in the market clearing price. And by default, if they're not collected from that generator, they get pushed over into the uplift bucket. Right? So we already know that we have costs that are sort of intrinsic to the generation fleet that we operate that we don't attempt to include in the clearing price. Part of the price formation initiative that PJM wants to do is to try to include those costs in the clearing price to minimize that bucket of uplift. Uh, there's some other issues around resources that are inflexible, like the fast start proceeding. Um, we also have other resources that have minimum block output points where they can't operate below a certain level. 
And when they're needed below that level and not at that level, they cannot set the price either. So we have costs of resources that we are running that aren't included in the clearing price. And so we know we've got a lot of things, a lot of costs on the system that we don't capture in the market clearing price. And we want to, we want to make a better attempt to make more holistic prices that capture more of those costs in the market because the market has benefited consumers, as, as Commissioner Powson has said. Better market clearing prices will enhance those incentives and enhance that competition. Uh, why is price formation good for consumers? So I think a lot of price formation gets focused on the supply side, but there are benefits to consumers as well. And those, those benefits follow the same benefits that the consumers have gotten from the market over the last 20 years. So uplift in the, in the PJM market is an unavoidable cost. And it's allocated to entities in the market, it's allocated to suppliers, it's allocated to loads, it's allocated to virtual traders. And they don't know what that cost is going to be until they get the bill. And so it presents this unknown risk um, that today on average is very low but can get very volatile. If you saw our most recent cold snap report, you'll see that the, the uplift during that period, which was about 10 days, was 10 times what the annual average is. Uh, so that number can be volatile and it can uh, diminish people's behavior in the market that can be beneficial to consumers. It can result in uh, risk premiums on retail rates, risk premiums on generation offers, and all these kinds of things that at the end of the day do not benefit consumers and do not benefit the efficiency of the market. And so the goal from our perspective is to reduce that uplift. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about the capacity market and uh, the Moper X and the repricing. Uh, at the end of the day, the capacity market roughly only accounts for about 25% of the revenues that go to a generator. 75% of it comes from the energy market and the incentives that are borne out by the energy market. And the energy market and the capacity market have very, very different incentives. The capacity market incentivizes low capital cost at the expense of uh, time. So it, the capacity market may see um, a project that has a low capital cost but a very high marginal cost in real time. And it's the marginal cost in real time that affects the end use customer's energy bill. So if a generator gets built from a capacity market perspective and it, its cost to operate is $900 a megawatt hour, when that generator operates, if it sets the price, the consumer is paying that because the capacity market doesn't discriminate over real time operating costs. It looks at capital cost. The energy market benefits the resources that have low marginal operating costs and operate all the time to the benefit of the consumer. So in the energy market, that $900 unit may never run. But the low cost natural gas plan or nuclear plan or whatever the fuel type is, that resource that is the lowest cost and the most beneficial to consumers is the one that is rewarded the most in the energy market. And it's important to, to distinguish between those two sets of incentives because we talk about the capacity market a lot and it gets a lot of publicity. The energy market is where most of the money is exchanged in PJM and where most of the incentives to build new projects comes, comes from. Uh, and the last is reliability risk. I'll touch on this in a couple slides when I talk about the demand curves for the reserve markets. Uh, really what we want to do is make sure that we are carrying an appropriate amount of reserves in real time and that we send appropriate price signals when we can't meet those reserve requirements so that we incentivize entities in the market to act in a way that promotes reliability. Today we have a set of rules that do this today. We think we can improve those. Uh, and that's what we're looking to do when we talk about things like changing the shortage pricing rules. Uh, the reserve market design, I just covered some of this. Uh, really what we're looking at in the initial phases of the price formation senior task force we have uh, in the stakeholder process is looking at re, um, reinventing the way we do the reserve markets today. So today we have two types of reserves that are 10 minute type reserves. We have a certain demand curve that we use to uh, procure those reserves. And really what we want to look at is, are we carrying the right reserve products? Are we valuing them correctly? And when we say valuing them correctly, that basically looks at the shape of that demand curve because that demand curve dictates how the load values the reserves that they have on the system. And so from a reserve market perspective, that's what we're looking at. As I said before, the short-term goals of that senior task force and PJM are really focused on this reserve market concept. So when I talk about the demand curves for reserves, uh, we have a set of rules called shortage pricing. Uh, that's the set of rules that we use to set energy and reserve market prices when we can't simultaneously meet the energy and reserve needs of the system. 
we have a set of demand curves that we do that with. And so across the top where you see current curve, that is the type of curve that we use today. Um, it has been in place since 2012 since we put shortage pricing um, into the market systems. That curve um, is largely a uh, negotiated curve through the stakeholder process. Um, the cost function on that curve, the $850 per megawatt hour, stems from the reserve cost during an event back in 2007. And so we've got a curve that is um, sort of the initial curve that's probably a little bit dated based on um, costs from 2007, so roughly 10 years old. And we've done a lot of research. A lot of other folks have done research on ways to better model these curves. Um, Commissioner Powelson brought up ERCOT. ERCOT does it in the way that you see on the bottom, where they use this concept of a loss of load probability function and a value of loss load. And really what they're trying to say is the more reserves uh, that they have on the system, the lower the chance of shedding load in real time is. And the incremental value of additional reserves declines as the reserve amount increases. And so at some point, you have so much reserves that there's no chance you shed load in real time and the value is zero. But as you erode that reserve capability, the chance that you shed load in real time for some unknown event increases and so the value of the reserves increases as well. That's the type of concept that PJM has put out there that we're working on in the stakeholder process. We think it's, it's rooted in pretty good academic merits. Uh, and we want to talk about it more with the stakeholders. Uh, here is the high level timeline we're working on with the price formation group. The blue box is really where we're focused right now. So reserve accuracy, uh, fast start pricing to the extent that we actually get an order from FERC. Um, in, uh, by the time we can take action in the, in the first quarter, uh, I'm sorry, by the third quarter of this year. Uh, and then some changes to the demand curve, as I said, and some of the reserve zone modeling that we've got. Some of the longer term issues you can see there in the orange and the green boxes. Um, 30 minute reserve market, sort of full blown operating reserve demand curve modeling. And then you can see in the long term, uh, the, the broader ELMP or extended LMP implementation that was the, the subject of the November paper by PJM and also some discussion about reserve modeling in the day ahead market. So from a price formation perspective, that's where we are. I'm gonna take a left turn and talk about capacity repricing really quickly. Uh, if you were not involved in this process or uh, aren't, aren't up to date on a lot of the FERC filings in this area, we had a long stakeholder process um, to discuss issues uh, and how to how to, how to how to accommodate or how to handle subsidized resources in the capacity market. And the concept is if a resource is collecting out of market revenues, it has the incentive to underbid its cost in the market because it's collecting revenues outside of the market. And that action suppresses the clearing prices for all the competitive entrants in the market that are relying on the clearing price. So the concept is the subsidies have a downward pressure on the clearing price based on out of market actions that has um, significant impacts on all the competitive entrants that are relying on that capacity market for entry and exit decisions. So that was the concept. There was a handful of different proposals. It really came down to two different concepts. One is the PJM repricing concept. The other is the IMM or our independent mon market monitors, MOPRX. They are not terribly different and I'll explain where the difference is, but there is one key difference. So the concept of the repricing is entities offer into the capacity market if, there are, if they are collecting a subsidy and they underbid their cost, in the initial phase of that repricing approach, we accept that bid as is and we clear the market. That stage one clearing determines the resources that will uh, receive a capacity commitment for the given delivery year. Then we go back in stage two and we identify those resources that are collecting a subsidy and we replace their offer with a reference price. And that reference price could be a, a couple different things. In our filing, we proposed either a unit specific or a class based um, sort of uh, reference price, um, just to try to reflect what the actual going forward cost for that unit would be. In stage two, we re-clear the market, but all we take from stage two is the clearing price. So we've got the market clearing result being the set of resources committed in stage one, and all the clearing prices from stage two. And the point of stage two is just to reconstruct the clearing price that doesn't have the downward pressure that subsidies would otherwise impose on it. That's the concept. So at its heart, the PJM repricing proposal 
clears the subsidized resources, but comes up with a clearing price that doesn't have the impact of subsidies in it. The MOPR X, again, somewhat similar, but there's a critical, critical difference. The MOPR X takes all the bids in as is, but it replaces the subsidized offer prices and then clears the market. So if there's a resource that has a subsidy that offers low, in the MOPR X, that offer gets replaced and the market gets cleared. And if that resource doesn't clear because its replaced price is higher than the market clearing price, then that resource doesn't get a capacity commitment. And, and therefore, the entities that are in that state would have to pay for capacity to cover their load obligation, plus potentially the cost of the subsidy as well. So the MOPRX has this concept where loads may pay twice for capacity. The repricing uh, proposal tries to eliminate that by clearing the subsidized resources but calculating a price that doesn't reflect the value of the subsidy. So those are the two different proposals that were part of the, the PJM jump ball. We filed that on April 9th. Um, we are expecting something from FERC sometime in the June time frame. I wrote early June here. I'm not sure if it's early or late June, but it is in June. And the, the goal would be to implement that by the time we get to not this coming base residual auction, but the following one. And so, again, that's another proceeding. It's in front of FERC, and, and we'll see where they end up there. The final topic I wanted to talk about today was resilience. Uh, and so resilience has uh, quite a lot of different arms to it. Um, system operations, obviously, system planning, security, markets. Um, from PJM's perspective, we are taking a holistic approach to looking at resilience. So uh, this issue came out of the DOE NOPR. Uh, that FERC eventually rejected, and then they opened their own informational proceeding with the set of questions that, uh, that PJM filed responses to, I believe, back in March. Um, so the FERC goals of that uh, develop an understanding among the industry on what resilience is. So FERC put out a definition. It wasn't terribly different than a lot of uh, other of the ISO RTOs who are working on this sort of plan, operate, recover type definition. Uh, and they want to use this information to evaluate whether FERC needs to take action in other areas. And so they sent out a list of questions. I think there was three questions, but there was like 30 subparts or something like that. Um, and so we filed comments to that along with every other ISO and RTO. At the highest level, I think our filing was 100 and some pages. At the highest level, these were the major points we were trying to communicate. So one, I think, is the RTOs, well, first off, FERC, um, the planning, planning for resilience, PJM wanted FERC to, to confirm that that was part of their uh, responsibility and part of their jurisdiction, and further clarify that RTOs are responsible for, plan, or for including resilience as part of the planning process. So that was issue number one. Uh, issue number two was addressing whatever resilience needs we have through market-based approaches. So if you think about the markets we know today, they've done a very good job at driving down consumer costs but they've never been tasked with modeling resilience uh, goals. And they can do that to the extent we can define those goals and they can drive those goals out and meet those goals at the lowest cost. We just need to decide what those goals are and we need to implement them. And so that was, that was point number two. Uh, point number three was RTO um, authority during emergency events. And so if we have some sort of degraded operations, we wanted FERC to confirm the RTO's authority in those instances, especially when the market doesn't exist. Uh, so that was point number three. And then point number four was essentially better gas electric coordination. So we have FERC Order 787 that, that uh, provided the venue to get some communication between the gas and electric markets. Um, but we think there's more to go and more coordination that we can do with the gas industry to make sure that uh, that interdependency between those two industries is kept as seamless as possible. So the resilience roadmap is what I've got in front of you today. Uh, we are working on a handful of different things. Uh, I talked about earlier looking at reserve markets and how we model reserves in the RTO markets today and trying to look at are we doing that right? Do we have the right products? Are we incentivizing the right type of assets? So that activity is going on right now. Uh, the other one I want to talk about is under the operate, it's the fuel security analysis. So I think Monday, PJM issued a letter from uh, our CEO indicating further analysis that we were going to do regarding um, uh, sensitivities to the interdependency between electric and gas and trying to model better the, vulnerab the vulnerabilities of the fuel supply system 
and trying to determine whether there's a need there that needs to be addressed probably from a capacity market perspective. So that issue is out there as well. That is something that is really just in its infancy at this point, uh, that, but we are gonna start looking at that going into the future. Uh, and obviously, uh, with resilience also comes along uh, a lot of the cybersecurity type issues, which you don't really see quite clearly on this, uh, but they are certainly important. Uh, and we have the SRAC, uh, which is a stakeholder group that handles those kinds of issues. Um, so with that, I, I'll, I'll round it off and I'll turn it over to questions. If you have any, I, I'd certainly love uh, to take questions. Great, thank you, Adam. Um, I think we have two microphones. I'm going to uh, do the back of the room. I'll try and uh, actually service the front of the room for you here, Franz, as well. Any questions for, for Adam? Start with Scott here. And, you, and then maybe, Franz, you can. Thank you. I just was curious about if you could address, if you have any thoughts on the kind of price and economic effects or impacts that you expect to see from the Moper X. I mean, it, that that differential between the, the way you looked at it under either scenario. Uh, in terms of the capacity market, I, I probably wouldn't expect in the short term there would be much difference. The concept is you're replacing the offer prices for the units. So as long as you use the same replacement price, it's probably not gonna turn out too terribly different of a price. One of the one of the other differences with the, the Moper X and the repricing proposal is in the repricing proposal, um, the subsidized unit gets a capacity commitment and therefore it, it sort of is counted towards running in the energy market and three years forward. In the Moper X proposal, it doesn't get a capacity commitment, which means something else probably did. And there's this potential in the Moper X that we, um, we have the new entrant, the competitive new entrant that cleared in lieu of the subsidized resource, but we have the subsidized resource too. And so when we get into real time, we have uh, maybe more supply than we need that could lead to suppressed energy market prices. Uh, a lot of that remains to be seen, but conceptually you could see how that could happen. Uh, but a lot of that re remains to be seen on terms of what the impacts are and things like that. Um, hi, uh, Stephanie Grumet from Capstone. Um, hi, Adam. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> I'm uh, wondering about the timing if if FERC decides not to pursue resilience, what would the timing be for shortage pricing and price formation reform or when you think you would get those proposals? Yeah, so the goal right now, and again, we're, we're gonna, I'll, I'll separate that initiative from, from resilience, um, more from like an initiative type perspective and a timing perspective than anything. What we are looking to do with the shortage pricing and reserve market reforms is move some of those changes through the stakeholder process, hopefully by the third quarter of this year and try to implement something by the end of this year. Um, if you read our resilience comments, you'll see that we talked about the, the reserve markets um, have the ability to meet resilience objectives but weren't necessarily targeted to do that. So I would have pulled them apart from a timing perspective, but at the end of the day, they are sort of knit together. Uh, but just from what we're doing in the stakeholder process, we're trying to move that through by the third, fourth quarter of this year to try and implement something by the winter time. Other questions? Any hands? And while we're waiting for hands, just want to note the webcast audience, when you received a, a confirmation of your registration for the webcast, you received a telephone number to text any questions you have. So that's, that's how you get questions into the room. Any other questions? I was either super clear or I put everybody to sleep. No, no I've, I've got Doug here. He's awake. Hey, Adam. So, you know, you, uh, the question came to uh, Commissioner Powelson this morning about is there a third way uh, in the, with the jump ball uh, with the two proposals that are there? I'm wondering what your response to that would be, one, and, and two, what happens if they decide they like either one of them? What happens then? <laughs> uh, for, for the third way, can you just clarify your question real quick? I think I missed the first part of it. Is I apologize. There, is there, if, 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 it was asked if FERC could come up with something different than the Mopar oh, yeah. or yeah. what, what, what PJM put forward. Yeah, um, certainly if FERC has a different plan. Uh, you look at Casper in New England, right? That's a different way to handle the issue. So certainly, should FERC elect to do so, um, you know, maybe move something like Casper down to PJM, and I think. I think probably with the appropriate modifications, you know, maybe something like that works. 
New England's fighting a different issue than, than what we've got in PJM where they've got the subsidized entrant, we've got a subsidized unit that maybe should exit. So it's a little bit of a different setup. Uh, but certainly should folk elect, uh, FERC elect to impose something, I think you know, we'd have to obviously take a good hard look at it and file comments to that and we'll see where we end up. Uh, if they don't do anything, I think it's going to be back to the drawing board for us. Um, I don't, this is not an issue that I think we're going to let go uh, just because you know, we're in a place where we need to protect the markets from externalities and we look at it as our job to do that and I think even if FERC doesn't like the two proposals we've got, uh, it will still be an issue that we pursue. How we exactly do that is tough to tell right now, but it will be something that, that we continue to pursue. Hi, thanks for the, uh, the talk. It was very interesting. I'm Sarah Jordan, from a, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins SAIS. I'm interested if you could speak more to, uh, clearly there are very real differences between RTOs on the fuel supply and fuel security risks uh, that are becoming more prominent with increased natural gas generation. I'm interested if you could speak to those and also speak more towards uh, PJM's initiatives towards clarifying and, and investigating the potential fuel supply security risks uh, within uh, your jurisdiction. Yeah, th thanks for the question. So. Um, uh, Commissioner Palson talked a lot about New England, and they ha obviously have some significant issues. If you read their filing in the resilience comments where they called out a lot of the gas electric issues, uh, they are, you know, they rely on the gas market, but they are certainly in a very different spot than where we are. Um, we have not had significant instances where there have been delivery risks of uh, gas. Yes, we've had interruptions, but they haven't been significant enough to, po to pose a reliability risk. So from that perspective, we are vastly different from where they are. I'm not entirely sure where New, where New York's at, uh, but just comparing and contrasting us in New England, I think there's, there's sort of vastly different issues. Um, the fuel um, security study. Uh, so probably, I guess it's probably about two years ago now, PJM did sort of a, a fuel diversity study where we looked at the, the different capabilities of units of different fuel types and tried to figure out, well, how much gas is too much gas? And it turns out that that number was somewhere in the 85% range. But that, that document was really looking at unit capability, not delivery system capability. And while it put out this number of 85%, that 85% needs to probably get, um, you probably need to take into account with that, that we also need to study the, the delivery risk. And right now, we don't have a delivery risk. But frankly, from our perspective, we don't, we don't want to be where New England's at. And so we are trying to get in front of this issue, and even though we don't have an issue today, we want to make sure that we continue to not have an issue, both from a reliability and resilience perspective. And so that's why you see uh, the, the letter from the CEO now trying to get in front of this issue uh, when we don't have a problem today. And so I don't know the results of that study um, because we're still trying to kick around exactly how we want to do it. Uh, but certainly we are going to look at... Um, you know, not only the gas delivery system, but, you know, uh, diesel trucks and how often they can, you know, refill on-site storage and things like that. So it will go beyond natural gas, and we will try to look at it as holistically as possible. And again, the, the idea is get in front of the issue. We don't want to be in the same position that New England is in. Franz? I have one from the webcast audience. Sure. Um, and just for the webcast audience, when you use that number that was in the, your confirmation email to text us questions, please let us know who you are. Uh, this one doesn't have that information, but I'll read it anyway. In joking about the PJM jump ball, Commissioner Powelson referenced the possible need for governance reform at PJM to better account for stakeholder input. Do you have any comment? Um, do I have a comment? <laughs> I spent a lot of time in stakeholder meetings, so I do. Um, you know, I think the stakeholder process is a great process for getting feedback and vetting proposals and understanding the interests and things like that. But just frankly, we have a difficult time um, moving forward on what I'll just characterize as big ticket items. Uh, it, it is, it's difficult to navigate with some of these larger issues. And so are there ways we can make the process more efficient? I, I'm, I'm sure that there are, uh, but there's value to the process uh, nonetheless, and I think we just need, we need to make sure that we, we understand the value we get out of it, and if there's governance changes, we need to make sure that we retain that value. 
but maybe try to strip out some more efficiency in, in uh, getting issues to maybe move a little quicker, getting bigger issues through that process more expediently. And so, you know, I, I would love to see that, but I think we just, we need to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think we can take one more question and then we'll probably uh, transition to our next panel. Any last question? Hi, Mark Labs from Modern Energy. I was curious, you, you talked a little bit and it, it's reflected on this slide about resilience in your work there. I'm particularly interested in how you're thinking about storage, DERs, other, resource, other resources that may, for example, not have on-site fuel supply or, or even need fuel uh, provided in general in thinking about what those resilience definitions are and, and sort of how are you thinking about these new emerging energy class resource types in the broader re resilience study? Yeah, th thanks. So what's interesting is we also, we always, we talk about things like on-site fuel supply and, you know, that was the subject of the DOE NOPER, but having worked in system operations, every resource type has its vulnerability. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is, if the fuel site, you know, if you have a coal pile sitting within the fence, if it's frozen or if it's wet, you know, you can run into problems with that. So, so no type of resource that I know today is completely immune to some type of weather event, some type of fuel delivery issue or something like that. So um, I don't know that on-site fuel supply is the is the silver bullet in that issue, but certainly uh, with some of the DER type resources you're talking about, um, we haven't looked at those a ton quite specifically, but we've certainly been with folks about pairing them with uh, conventional generators to try and uh, make those generators more resilient. Things like that we have heard folks talk about. In terms of the broader fuel cost study, we're just not at the point where we're in uh, a level of detail that is enough to provide you a more detailed response, but certainly that discussion is ongoing, yeah. Oh. Thank you, and thank you, Adam. Let's please join me in thanking Adam for... Thank you.